Alrighty. I'm, I'm recording. All right, excellent. Me too. Uh, so that said, uh, hello and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Treasure Hunting. How to find return on investment in software localization. Our special guest or main presenter is Anna Schlegel, Senior Director at NetApp. Um, this webinar is hosted and co-presented by NetTranslators. And uh, why don't we quickly introduce ourselves? Uh, head to the next slide, please. All right, Anna, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks. Chris and uh, hi David, this is Anna Schlegel. I'm sitting in a conference room here in uh, beautiful Sunnyvale, California. Um, the um, topic today is treasure hunting, how to find ROI in software localization, uh, which is a very dear and near uh, project in, in my team and I'm happy to share some of my thoughts. Thank you. Awesome. David, you just came back from vacation. Yeah, it was great. I, I had to write down uh, my address where I worked so I could find the place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was great. It was a great three weeks uh, in east, west, and uh, the, the middle of, uh, of the country. Uh, it, was, it was a fun time, fun family time was had by all. Um, uh, most people know me. I'm the Director of Strategic Operations at Net Translators, and we are extremely fortunate that uh, Anna is going to give us her insights into ROI and software localization. This is a great topic, uh, something that we haven't really touched on so much as you know on a on a macro topic as this and uh, and we're as I mentioned we're very fortunate to have Anna with us uh, a dear friend and a great person that I've known for several years awesome thanks Anna all right uh, my name is Chris Chris Ralph I'm the, the founder and president of a, a company called Boulder SEO marketing I used to be in the localization and in internationalization industry for a long time I still enjoy organizing these events and I saw the presentation honor that you're giving today at the information development world last October and uh, you were kind enough to do this presentation for us today so guys it's all you Excellent, thank you. So yes, I gave this presentation last October at IDW in, I believe it was San Jose, and I have a little bit of an update. We've been able to track more ROI since then, so I'm so happy uh, because as I was looking at the results and the numbers that I reported uh, at IDW, the numbers have gone up. So it's a lot of fun to, to watch you know, the ROI in a couple of products that we've launched. All right, so um, I've been running globalization teams now for about 20 some years. And, uh, you know, I started as a translator. When I started as a translator, I didn't know what impact translators and localizers and QA testers have within a company. But in, you know, in, in the, the years that passed, I realized that actually globalizers or anybody who's in a globalization team are an incredible asset for any company. And um, the, this talk today or these these thoughts that I, I want to share today show that people in globalization teams have so much insight for the company and can help companies so much even if you're at the beginning of your career and you don't know how you're influencing the company in being successful globally. And that's why I always say that globalizers have the end-to-end -end advantage because you understand globalization for the company and you understand it for marketing and for product and for legal and for support. And there's very few other people in a company that have that bird's eye view of of uh, how a company goes global. So I'm um, very proud of anybody in the globalization space. And uh, if you can understand the role that you have for your company, that's really awesome. So I work at a company uh, called NetApp. NetApp is a storage company. We sit in the Silicon Valley. We're in 150 countries. Um, and the model that we have is a centralized model. We are the center of excellence for globalization at the company. And what that means is that we serve all the major departments that need to go global. 
we're the ones that coordinate the languages, the vendors, the internationalization efforts, what products we're going to globalize, what departments are doing well, what departments are lagging behind. Uh, we have strategies, we have uh, localization PMs, we have reviewers, we have uh, systems architects, um, we have uh, product release managers, uh, we have vendor managers. So it's a, a great team. It's a, a really good model uh, if you want to centralize globalization. This presentation that I'm about to share is, is not a presentation, I think, that you can pull off if you're in a very small team and you don't have the resources or you're not very well connected within the company uh, because you are going to need a lot of numbers and a lot of power behind what you're going to say. So presenting product ROI is really for a team that understands the countries very well, that has really good connections to the product managers, to the sales managers, the people in the deal desk, and so it's for it's for an enterprise team. I, I don't want to uh, imply that this is an easy thing to do. And so one thing that we do in in our team, in the globalization team here at NetApp, is we gave ourselves a rally cry. We said, you know, we are here to accelerate the revenue for the company. And once we understood that, everything changed. So we are not here to globalize everything. We're here to globalize a few things that we know are going to return maximum investment for the business. And a, a good way to start is looking at a list of products, and then you start tracking those products. Our value proposition is to accelerate this international revenue, to really understand the product and solutions portfolio that we want to push globally, and obviously all of that is to make the lives of our customers better. All right, so um, I will give you a peek on some of the things that we will talk if you want the secret sauce of uh, my team. Uh, again, it's not a small team, it's an enterprise setup, um, and this is why we some of these things off. Okay, so a concept that I always talk about, and it's a concept that it took me a few years to get to this, is many localization teams in companies focus mainly on what I call the black box. And the aha for us was if we wanted to start showing ROI, we needed to create different metrics, and we created something that we call the transparent box. So we always talk about what are the black box metrics and what are the transparent box metrics. The transparent box metric is the a little bit the, the scary, uncomfortable area where globalization teams need to be very well aligned with department heads and vice presidents and senior directors that run the departments that we service. And so what you want to do is you want to have a really good understanding of what these executives need. For example, if the company wants to hit in China really hard, then you need to start meeting with the country manager in China, and you need to start meeting with the product heads of uh, China, and you want to meet with the sales guys in China, and you want to meet with the deal desk in China. Is that a regular thing that localizers do? Not really. But if you want to start showing how you're bringing value to the business, this transparent box is very, very important. And I, I think it will become a little bit apparent through the presentation. So you need to create new muscles and skills for your team to be able to do this. Because the first time I had to meet with the vice president, I 
you know, it <laughs> felt very uncomfortable. So you need to train your team um, and you need to map your team with who is going to talk to whom and why are you talking to them and what information you want to um, get from these executives. So in my team, we spend a lot of time in this transparent box. And I'll tell you a little bit more throughout this presentation on why this is so important. Anna, the black uh, box, yep. Mm -hmm. um, before, before I go through the, the black box, I, I actually um, I wanted to ask you um, at, right here at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I, I, as you know, we're our attendees are from various industries, and um, and in our experience, what we what we're seeing um, at, is as companies mature in the localization uh, maturity model, what we see is that um, companies are becoming more selective. Um, with the type of content um, and uh, and regions that they're um, that they're approaching, um, right. in your, does this what what you're what you're talking about here um, on ROI is this something that is um, industry specific or um, or can this apply to any industry? Uh, it seems to me that the, that this might be um, something that would be applicable in um, uh, qu uh, quite a few of the industries, but not every industry that localizes. So, who who is asking who is asking for this ROI? No one. I want to know. Mm -hmm. So, so the transparent box. Um, I agree uh, because I am very well connected to other colleagues in the industry, and I talk to a common sense advisory all the time, and. Um, you know, I, I, I see what's happening out there. So not localizing everything for everybody and being very, very purposeful on what you localize is the new in, I think. Um, com you know, you know that I has been hit. Uh, going global is actually very difficult. You don't want to go global the same in two different countries. And so the transparent box is for everybody, yeah, every single uh, industry. If you're Netflix, you want to understand the country that your executives want you to be in. If you're Zara, you want to understand where you're going to be open source. If you're Nike, same thing. It, so it doesn't matter if, um, if you are leading a localization or globalization team, it really serves you very well to be very well aligned to the executives and the countries, and the executives I mean the heads of the departments to understand what are their goals to go global. And even better, if your CEO has something published, that is the bomb. That is ideal what you need in a company. But in reality, you need to go and do a lot of that digging. And that's why I put people in my team to constantly be playing in this transparent box so that we can paint the picture of what are the key products for key countries. We don't want to be everywhere. So, so essentially, uh, um, if I can understand the process, the, um, uh, the management, the marketing will decide which markets to, uh, um, that they want to target. Um, you'll begin by targeting and then you'll then you'll be able to measure the ROI for that specific market rather than the reverse say okay um, if we want to um, uh, market to uh, you know, Slovenia um, can we d measure an ROI before we go ahead and and actually try to go into that market so in our case it's the first scenario that you explained so, and I've been in companies that did it the other way around. But um, here, what we do is we seed with the department head and we understand what goals do they have for specific countries. And then you start painting the picture, for example, of how every single executive is investing in Japan or is investing in Italy. Um, and so, because we are the center of excellence, we can quickly paint the picture of, let's say, 
you know, we're go we have good plans to globalize Italy, but maybe one department is not aligned, so then we go and have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And then in this process, we identify what are the things we're going to track. And then we go back to these departments and we actually explain what happened to the product or the program. But um, we're just at the beginning of the presentation, David, so I, I, I'm sorry. If you let, <laughs> let me go a few more slides, it will, it will become a little bit more apparent. Yeah. And then, David, with, with companies like yours, um, it's very, very important that we have great partners in the localization vendors, in the internationalization vendors, where you guys help the machinery or the factory or the incredible black box that just cranks out all the content um, within, within brand, within the SLAs, within the pricing. Um, and that's where the partnership with globalization vendors is so, so important so that we can do the transparent work and we can do the more strategic work if we have really great vendors uh, that help us run these millions of words, um, then we rest, you know, assured that we can spend more time on the transparent part. So, David, from from your perspective, how how are you guys helping uh, companies? Well, as you as you as you had mentioned, um, our job is to be a, a cog. In, in your mechanism. In other words, we have to uh, we have to make sure that uh, our resources are ready and standing by f when you need them. We need to uh, we need to plan correctly around your schedules, um, and we have to be uh, even though it's a black box, we have to be transparent uh, to you um, to what our capabilities are and uh, what we can and cannot handle. Um, right. Together with that, right. we can we, we can also perform uh, a consulting role um, in terms of you know uh, if uh, if our, our customer chooses uh, a specific CMS for instance you know how are we going to best interface with that CMS what types of uh, suggestions can we give to our customers um, in order to uh, allow them to make that block black box um, you know more runs more smoothly um, in the end the, the the goal is not that the uh, you know the goal is to understand up front what you need as a customer um, uh, in terms of not what your stated needs are but in, in terms of what your real needs are and to make sure that that we can give you enough direction so together we can uh, meet those uh, meet those needs um, and you know certain certainly uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know what you're localizing and why you're localizing is also very important for us to understand. So the the partnership begins really um, uh, at at the uh, at the stage way before uh, we get the first word to translate. Excellent, good, thanks, David. All right, so um, this is again a little bit of insight as to how I organize my teams. Um, and actually, you know, I run other teams, not just globalization teams. We always do this. We do the transparent box and we do the black boxes. So this presentation um, is mainly about the transparent box, knowing that the vendor has your back and has you covered with black boxes. Um, so I'm going to spend a lot of time now talking about the transparent box, and because we spent this amount of time on the transparent box, we were able to get to the ROI of the product. All right, so let's talk about this puppy. This is a transparent box. There are some tips um, that um, I give my team so that we study the company and then we can actually help the company do better with some products. So tip number one, to go fast, and you all want your companies to go fast and succeed internationally, you have a role in this. 
So to go fast, you need to study your company. And to study your company, you actually need to prepare. You want to understand what are the top company goals. So for example, um, again, I work for NetApp, so I need to understand what are our goals around storage. Is it flash? Is it cloud? So what are the goals? How do we align to them? I want to make sure that the projects my team is working on actually work on those goals. If I see somebody working on you know, something that's off the reservation, we will definitely be questioning that. Who are the executives that are thinking global and understand your goals? It's very important for us here at NetApp to align ourselves with executives have, who have been very successful in going global here at NetApp or at other companies or have even worked. We have some executives here that have been in boards of directors of translating agencies. So we quickly align ourselves with them because we you need a cool Coalition. You need some champions. You need people that will help you further your goals as a team. Very important that we clear up who's going to be paying for the projects. You might have a central budget. You might have a decentralized budget. So if you're choosing a product that you cannot afford, you're obviously going to have to uh, go and uh, get some funding. Very, very important. You want to understand what are the countries that matter to your company. This is very, very important. It took me a couple companies to get this. So at the beginning, you know, years ago, my team just used to localize and we were just going the same way across many, many countries. And then here we sort of stopped because we understood that in the super high-tech environment where we are, not everybody needs the same type of content or the same type of product depending on what country you're in. How do people get things done? So the processes inside the department, do they include globalization? Do they stop and think that what they're building is actually going to have to go global? What value does your company have? So um, for example, what is the value of NetApp within a particular country is very, very important to understand. Um, it, the, the ranking that you have in that country what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to push your company one dot or one percentage up? Or where's the market position of your company? You want to understand this. You can also ask your vendor, right? So here's where somebody like David can bring in, if you don't have a lot of people in your team to help you achieve some of these things or understand some of these questions, you might want to brainstorm with your vendor. Uh, they, they might have you know, the manpower, or they can lend you a person or two to help you do some of these analyses. So learn your company. And I'm pretty sure, David, you guys help other companies do this, right? We certainly try. <laughs> Good. Awesome. So that was tip number one. Tip number two, something that we do in my team, is we partner. We partner with every single department. And every department, let's say professional services, HR, legal, marketing, sales, channel, product, what makes up the enterprise, we identify a main champion in each department. And this person is our spokesperson, is the person we align with to make sure that the programs that need to go global are in fact going global and are aligned with the countries and the geographies. So we invest a lot of time with these department champions so that we understand how much, when, and what. And based on that, we create these roadmaps. And then we, we go by these roadmaps on a yearly or quarterly basis. And those are our go-to-market plans uh, as far as globalization per department. So at the end of the day, you end up with you know, 10 to 12 roadmaps um, that you can derive a picture for Japan or for China. But this, each one of these roadmaps is going to explain how legal is going global, how IT is going global, how sales is going global, how HR is going global 
a product is going global, how marketing, channels, sales, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Anna. Each one of these. Yep. Uh, just a quick question. Do these champions uh, meet with you on a weekly or monthly or quarterly basis? How do you communicate with them? Yeah, good question. So some departments need a lot of hand holding. So let's say marketing, product, and support in a company are, to me, you know, the, the top departments that you want to globalize. You want to market your products, you want to globalize your products, and you want to support your products. So with those departments, you're constantly meeting with them. Maybe it's every other week. Um, with departments like legal and HR and IT and professional services where they don't have so much to globalize, uh, you might want to meet with them once a month. Uh, what we're trying to institutionalize right now is like a report card uh, from my team to this department so that we show them, hey, this is where we invested, this is how much we invested, and these are the programs we invested. And so when you create that, you start creating these really tight connection and you start ingraining globalization uh, in those departments and you make them think, right? You're like, oh, you're going global in China and Japan. What's the story about Korea? And so we think um, it, it's very useful for us. So we stay very, very close to them. Great, thanks. And, and you know, finding an executive that wants to do this with you, it's, it's not always easy, but it's, it's doable. And we found some, you know, NetApp, as an example, is a very, very open collaborative company. And, you know, we, we have a very clear picture of the countries we want to be in. So once you've been doing this for a few years, um, you get a pretty clear picture. We've been doing this for several years, so it kind of works well for us. And people like to see, you know, the accountability back from my team into their team uh, with a lot of clarity. So partnering, right? Like how you would partner with anybody. A lot of clarity, a lot of trust. Number three. So uh, this is an example of how companies, uh, and this is not NetApp's model, by the way. So this is how companies uh, organize themselves to go to market. And this is an example, but it's very, very useful that the CEO or the C-suite have countries grouped because you don't have the money to serve all these countries the same. And so we tier the countries, and I think many companies tier countries already. This is not a new concept. I've seen it done for many, many years, where, uh, for example, a tier one would be a country like Japan, which is an enterprise country, and you want to globalize everything for Japan because the English tolerance among Japanese you know, IT employees is relatively low compared to Norway or Sweden as an example. And so you want to map where you investing your uh, your money uh, and with that you create a go-to-market model. So the grouping of countries is very, very useful and if you can publicize that within your company, it's going to save you a lot of headaches because you can always go back to this grouping of countries and say, look, this is how we're doing this and this is how we're getting organized. And you can also draw some exceptions out of this if you have to. So that was tip three. Tip four um, is we try to get a lot of uh, geo input earlier. For us, geo means the geography or the theater or the main headquarters that group uh, that uh, represents a, con a set of countries. So we align very, very early in the planning cycles, you know, in the yearly AOPs, uh, where we connect to the general managers of each region and make sure that we triple check the countries, we triple check, you know, the departments. And so that helps us design our strategy for the year. For example, I might be meeting with the head of uh, Asia Pacific uh, where he 
or she can tell me, you know, Anna, this year we're going to make a, I'm just making it up, a huge deal with a company in Korea and we don't have support properly set up. We need your help there. And so by having these discussions early in the year, I know where I'm going to put my people, I know where I'm going to put my money, and I know what departments at headquarters I'm going to have to uh, spend a lot of time negotiating and uh, uh, making allies there. Another uh, very, this one seems very simple, but it's actually very uh, useful, is to understand your industry's user language capability. And this varies very greatly by industry and by country. Uh, but for example, so NetApp is a highly technical company. So what we sell goes to um, mainly men who have stu studied telecommunication and are systems engineers. So you need to understand that. And you need to understand that if you're a telecommunications engineer that you grew up in Spain, you're very good in English. And so for me to try to localize all these products for Spain is not going to make a lot of sense. It would be a nice to have, but it's not a must have. Um, and then in contrast to that, if I want to get into the Chinese government deals, I have to globalize and localize my product. So once you understand that, the level of English fluency from your customers and your users, that also clarifies a lot. Because when we started, we wanted to globalize the product for a number of languages. And the more time we spend in the transparent box, talking to the executives of Spain, Italy, and France, you know, we clearly understood that product is not, needs to, needs to be internationalized, but doesn't need to be localized, as an example. And so I love this graphic from Common Sense Advisory that shows, uh, this, this graphic here is English tolerance in, in my space in the high-end IT worker where um, you have a strongly agree or strongly disagree, sorry, in Japan where they, they want to see things globalized in English. They want to. They don't want to see things in English, right? Same uh, for China, etc. And then um, tip number six, we again, this is all about the transparent box. You want to be very visible, you want to understand the executives, you want sponsors, you need to be a diplomat, socializing, then you need to travel. Um, it's not for everybody, it's not all the time, and many companies have travel restrictions, but if you can, try to uh, travel or, you know, use Skype or a lot of the video conferencing because you need key participants to move your business forward, to prepare well and understand what's happening in the ground. You cannot make some of these decisions sitting in a cube, you know, in, in your headquarters. And this is the same if your company was, you know, started in Italy, you need to get out of Italy, right? It doesn't matter that this is all about U.S. companies. If you're a Chinese company trying to, you know, conquer the world, then obviously we are seeing, you know, Lenovo opening up, uh, Huawei opening up offices all over the world, right? You need to get out there. And, and Anna, so, yep. oh, sorry to interrupt. Who would, who would you send? Is it yourself? Uh, what level of your team members are traveling for those meetings? Oh, such a good question. <laughs> So today in my team, we have globalization strategists, and those are the people that travel. And the head of product globalization always also travels a fair amount. Because, uh, for example, in the case of this ROI study, it was all about product globalization. So then the, 
person in my team who leads that, you know, she travels a fair amount. Great. Thanks. And, you know, and we go to the countries where we know we have to hit really hard because then we need to get put things in motion. All right, so here's the actual study that I'm going to show you. And again, this ROI that I'm about to show, it's because we have spent a lot of time in this transparent box. Because you cannot show up in a country and start asking questions if they don't know why the heck you're in that country. I remember the first times we started traveling, they would say, who are you and what do you want? You're not welcome here. It's the end of the quarter. We're closing sales. Get out of here. But once they understood that we were there to push international revenue, boy, they're like, well, you could have an office here if you want. Come anytime. All right. So uh, again, this is to prove ROI of a highly technical product. So this is not Twitter or Facebook or eBay or PayPal. This is NetApp, right? We produce this uh, hardware and software, very, very highly technical. So when I started at NetApp, um, the concept of product globalization, the company was doing so well and selling so well, the margins were there, that product globalization was not really in the top, it was not top of mind. Um, and so what I started explaining is that we were missing some opportunity because we weren't being invited as an example for bids with government or public sector in Japan or in Korea or in France. Um, and so that if we were to globalize the product, we would have a shot at projects with airports and ministries, and uh, police departments, and military, and you know, and so that's money. That equals money. Um, so, what is this light? Okay, this light actually just uh, will make sense a little bit uh, later. But basically, what we said is we're going to choose a couple countries and a couple products. And we're going to start putting some metrics around them, and we're going to start measuring them. So why did we choose product uh, to show the ROI was pretty obvious to me. Um, you know, when you get into a country, um, if, if your product is not in the language of the user, you're missing a huge base um, of, of the product. There's always those early adopters. It's like when the iPhone goes out, even if the iPhone was not in language, there would be a group of people that would go and buy the, that iPhone. I don't care in what country, even if it was Japan or China. But you would get stuck. You would get stuck because there is so many early adopters in a, in a country. For you to get to the fast followers or the, or the bigger masses, what I, what I set out to do was to prove that you need a globalization because if your customers cannot read, cannot download, cannot install, cannot do the, the more complex configuration, your product is not going to be successful. Maybe they're going to be able to download the OS and the basic features, but they won't be able to download all the features that you want them to download. And so I made the company a promise that if we were going to globalize product for Japan and China, we were going to skyrocketing sales. So as an, uh, we, here's where we started. We started in Japan. I said, give me one product and one country. Um, and we did some, um, you know, we had to meet with the analysts within the company and make some Kager projections for the market. And then we um, had to project and we had to study the revenue of the country over years. And so we then said, we are going to be able to capture additional revenue because we're going to get into an additional number of accounts that would not be talking to us otherwise. 
And so this is why the transparent box was so, so important for us because for me to be able to find the name of the accounts to target, to be able to market to these accounts, I had to have the previous buy-in from the executives in the country because I went ahead and I talked to these partners and I went to meet with them and I found out. I said, if I give you this software or these products, in your language, what are you going to do for me? And so these are very difficult conversations. And then once you agree, you actually need to start globalizing the product and get going. Um, and so what we said was that year over year, we were going to see additional money because of globalization. Um, and the, the 54, 57, 61, 65, are additional millions of dollars that we said we were going to bring in. Uh, we have surpassed these numbers in a big way already. And so these were very conservative estimates. Uh, but th this was an incredible success story for us and very easy to track because we had never globalized the product for Japan before. So who are the players that are going to help you figure out the ROI is very important because it takes a village unless you have an instance of a CRM like Sugar, uh, dot com, Sugar CRM or Salesforce where your salespeople are being asked to quantify and qualify every sale in a, in a foreign market. Uh, where they would have a drop down in Salesforce.com for example where it would say hey, I'm a salesperson in Japan and I was able to sell this product because it was localized. We don't have that. So it takes a village for us to figure out, you know, why was that product sold in Japanese and not in English? And so you, in this case it was me, or and then eventually I relegated this to the head of product in my team, um, you need to be like the ma master orchestrator. Uh, you need your boss aligned, ready to back you up. You need the country manager. You need the country manager to help you make the case, right? So the country manager is going to connect you to the right people within that office. You need your budget guru as your best friend because you need some money to globalize the product. You need your globalization team and your vendor super aligned behind it if the product needs to be internationalized or rectified somehow and you need a localization plan there. So that's in the case where the vendor needs to be really good to be able to back you up. Now my favorite person here is the deal desk program manager. I spent a lot of time with this person and I had to convince this person to start tracking and asking the question of every single sale Sale, sale that happened in that country, I wanted to know why did they buy it in English or why did they buy it in Japanese? And so we created a mini survey for this person to start asking that. And because of this person, that's how we started tracking the ROI. You want your channel director in the country, in this case Japan, you want this channel uh, director or VP to start talking, hey, NetApp now, is offering this product in Japanese. Why, you know, go and download the Japanese um, version. Uh, it needs to be prompted and, and poked by, by this person, right? Obviously, your product globalization engineering team needs to do a super job. Your local marketing team. The first time that we went out, you know, we had a press release about it. We um, had a good plan with the channel marketing uh, folks, etc. And then if you're lucky enough that you have a systems admin that can track the sales from Sugar CRM or from a Salesforce, you know, any sales uh, database uh, that tracks the revenue um, would be great. And then an amazing teller or graphic designer helps a lot. And obviously use your vendors if they can uh, prove uh, your case. So. Uh, here, uh, this is again what I was showing in uh, IDW. This is why you need these many people. 
uh, especially the deal desk, the channel directors, the product globalization, you know, why is uh, why are they necessary? Why is the key part of the puzzle? Um, um, I, I don't know, Chris, if you're going to sh send that to the participants, but you can read as to the, the value of this per person, right? Like if you grab the country manager, boy, the country manager, any country manager wants to see more money coming in, right? So uh, that would be why they need to be part of this puzzle. All right, so let me explain here. So this was the first time for NetApp product globalization. So I led this cross-functional team. Uh, I found uh, the the right product in within the engineering team. I had to have support behind me, the Japan team and the GPSO. The GPSO is my team. So what we did is we chose two products and we globalized these two products. I had to sell this to my executives because we had never, it was like a pilot or a leap of faith from from their end because the product was selling well in Japan. My promise to them is that it was going to sell even better um, and it was going to improve the customer success and going to foster you know, culture of change and action and the partners were going to see that we were invested in that country, etc. So these two products we're chosen because we spent a fair amount of time with the partners. We asked the partners, what are the products that would make the most impact in our customers' lives? And so they chose these two products. One is called System Manager and the other one was Snap Manager. Um, so within a few weeks, we started seeing the sales numbers just kicking in, kicking in, kicking in. And it was actually very good and very scary because within I think two weeks we saw a few million dollars already coming in because of the the fact that we had just posted this software in Japanese in our support site for our customers to start downloading. And so the first people that jumped to this, um, here are some examples was NetWorld. NetWorld is one of our or our biggest partner in Japan, massive partner that partners with EMC and VMware and Cisco um, and, and NetApp. And so they're very used to seeing globalized products, so they were very, very pumped. Um, we started making deals with police agencies and airport agencies and online shops and Bridgestone, right? Takuma, NTT, so these are big, big names in Japan. Within the first month or two, we started making these deals already. So again, this is another way of showing the same story. This slide here actually made it into the company in front of thousands of people. The CEO was so happy, you know, that there was a team that took this pilot, made it a uh, you know, took a chance and a risk, and so product ops was very happy because they had globalized the product, you know, with us, Japan was happy, and now global support was happy because they were sort of tired of hearing, you know, your products are in English and we don't understand them. So this was a way to show, you know, our success. All right, so this was the fun part, right? So these were the first couple of months and then we're like, okay, is anybody else going to start downloading this? And so what I asked my team was to start tracking the adoption. Um, and we do have some internal tools to look at the downloads. Uh, is a customer downloading the software in English or is the customer downloading the software in Japanese? And so we started tracking this this was year one. Year one, we were able to track $57 million. So this is $57 million that NetApp would have never seen before. So this was a really good story, right? This was a, a good story for other products that decided to open up their engineering teams to globalization. Uh, this was a great story for other countries. If this happened in Japan, well, what about China? Um, 
And so it was a great story all around. And this was year one. So just one product, one country, you know, nearly $58 million. So uh, this is another way of showing the dashboard, you know, because when you want to do uh, this deep dive with the vice presidents of now you want to hit another product, you want to show them, you know, how you're not only helping the customer, but in my experience, many, many times globalizing the product actually sanitizes the product and it brings the product quality higher because you're cleaning up operation uh, sys uh, the uh, the OS compliance um, um, gets better. So this is an example of another way of you going to the vice president and showing who has been buying. So here you have Canon, SoftBank, Sony. Uh, this was Yahoo Japan, Hitachi, and so you can track this. But why can I track this? Because my best friend is the deal desk manager. <laughs> and so that's why spending time on the transparent box paid off for us. We decided not to be a localization service, but we decided to branch out and become salespeople ourselves. So I'm happy to report that this year we were able to track $95 million. And so this is year two. And the $95 million now come not just from Japan, but from the fact that because we were able to portray the impact in Japan, now we're able to portray or start portraying the impact in China. So we just went live in China. And same thing, first month, $25 million just opened up with the government. So the benefits of globalizing product are uh, besides the extra money that you're going to make for your company, right? Your customer satisfaction w goes up. The actual sale sales goes up. It creates stickiness for your company into that country because the country believes that the company is serious about that specific country, right? It validates your team. I mean, my team is so happy that they understand the role in the company, right? You validate uh, the, the hard work of the team. You start creating alliances with sales guys, channel people, um, and all of a sudden, you start to understand the business much, much better, and you understand why is it important to do it in China, but not necessarily for us in Sweden, as an example. So this is the story of the little mm -hmm. engine that could. Um, and so it's a story of one product you know, into a couple countries. Um, I hope it excites and empowers people to, to embark in that journey if you haven't done that for your company. Wow, that's a awesome story. I, <laughs> I wish I could show a return investment like that to my clients. <laughs> um, why don't we, uh, so we have about five, six minutes time for Q&A. If uh, you would please submit your questions through the, the chat or the, the question box. And we're going to start with a question from Dipinder. Hey, how's it going? Um, do you also suggest to understand study localization industry in terms of best practices? Or would you suggest to go with localization vendor who is providing the best practices? Um, maybe like company like yours, Anna, and also for a smaller company. What, what are your suggestions? I do both. I always do both because... The vendor has a. The vendors see everything. They see so many different cases, right? So if you have a particular uh, idea and you don't, don't want to know how to go about it, talk to your account manager at the vendor. And I also try to stay very connected to my colleagues, right? So my colleagues at Cisco or at Microsoft or at VMware, we all know each other very well. So having the the connections and actually presenting the the issues as a brainstorm, uh, from a brainstorm angle, is going to be very helpful. I, I am not shy. <laughs> so you need to ask. To ask. Absolutely. Um, David, do you want to add something on that topic? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask um, to sort of uh, drill down. There's there, 
obviously many of our customers are in highly regulated industries such as uh, medical device for instance and uh, in that respect you sometimes find yourself localizing um, for regions where you may not have the uh, the return in that specific region but in order to uh, in order to uh, uh, market to an, a different region, you would still have to localize uh, for for that region. Uh, you know, just sort of just throw out an idea. You know, uh, if you're going to be uh, localizing uh, in Germany uh, and France, you may have to also localize uh, for uh, for Belgium, for instance. Um, so, uh, how would you be able to measure that? Uh, ROI uh, in 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 this uh, model, or would you be able to measure it? I, I don't think I would want to. So some companies don't ask for ROI. Certainly, my company didn't ask for ROI. I want I wanted to see the impact of my team. Mm. So to me, globalizing product is a no-brainer. You know, uh, CEOs should understand the value of that. But um, if it's a compliance Issue. We do do a lot of things at NetApp because of compliance, and we just do it because the legal department, you know, ask us to do that. So I necessarily don't have the manpower to go and prove the ROI of everything of everything we do. Right. Awesome. And then um, we have a question: Will the slides be shared as well? Anna, are you okay if we share the slides uh, along with the, the recording of this webinar? Um, I might have to scrap some stuff okay. out before we can share. Okay, so hopefully the slides or some of uh, portion of the slides will be available as well. Um, then let me see, David. Uh, how do localization translation agencies help in deciding what markets markets will offer higher return on investment? You're a consultant. <laughs> how do you well, do that? Uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, customer chooses a specific uh, um, they don't choose a language they choose a, a region that they that they would like to uh, penetrate so uh, as a uh, as a localization vendor for instance uh, if uh, a company said well you know we want to uh, we want to penetrate uh, uh, Central America so so we would have to be able to provide some insight um, on which part which dialects would be optimal um, for for their goals, um, and we would have to be able to uh, give them direction um, in order to achieve those goals. Uh, but but certainly we're we're more of a black box in, in those terms. You know, if someone says, well, you know, we want to uh, we want to translate our product into Urdu, uh, we figure that there's probably a very good reason for that, and uh, and we'll go ahead and we'll translate their product into Urdu. <laughs> Awesome. All right, we're actually basically at the top of the hour here. Um, Anna, what events do you usually go to in the Silicon Valley if somebody wants to meet with you face to face? What networking events or places do you hang out? Women in localization. Uh, IDW, because now I'm more interested in the content part of this. Um, I don't know, I don't tend to go to a lot of events, but, you know, if anybody wants to connect, uh, the, it's anna.schlegel at netapp.com. Awesome. Okay. Um, any last thoughts before we conclude here, Anna? Well, this is a story of a super high-tech product, right? So hopefully you're in an easier environment where, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a digital, digital is much, much easier to track. I used to work for Xerox, I used to manage the Xerox web team where we could track everything and you know, going global was a mandate across many, many, many languages. So each company is a different uh, study or a different approach and uh, not two companies are the same. So hopefully just take a few things uh, fr from this presentation, maybe they can be helpful. Awesome, David, any concluding thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I, just to reflect back on what Anna said uh, a minute ago uh, about content uh, um, and, and the, the rise of content, I think that that's really a, a direction that we're, we're seeing the industry go in and, uh, and, and 
the, uh, the localization of that content will, will actually be able to provide a lot of uh, a lot more ROI and a lot more measurable ROI than uh, than product will. Absolutely, and uh, actually, uh, I'll be speaking at Gala New York next week uh, on a topic that David, you and I have presented on as well: international SEO. Um, but that's a whole other topic. Um, that said, uh, I hope this presentation, I, I loved it, and I thanks so much for doing this. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, connect with us. And this uh, webinar recording will be made available shortly. Uh, thanks again, and we'll uh, talk to everybody soon again. All right, thanks. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Chris. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.